All right, so I'm Peter. I'm the one with the sports car mock-up in my spare bedroom. It wasn't my office. I just had to move it in because it got too big. Um, I made that tweet there about this project, and um, I really wanted to make a video to kind of explain more of what's going on here, give you some of my personal background as little as I can. Um, I've done a lot of takes in this video, but I'm just going to try and stick to the script now um, and just try and get it done in, uh, in one take here. So just briefly, my personal background, uh, I have a degree in industrial design. I've done a lot of personal projects. I did jobs in college. Um, I'm pretty good at SolidWorks. Um, I've worked as an automotive journalist for the past five years, so interviewing all kinds of designers and engineers in the auto industry. And uh, that's been really enlightening, but you know, I've always wanted to do this, and I feel like now is the right time. Um, I brought one other product to market called the Weather Orb, which you might be familiar with. Um, that was really kind of the idea of this, very similar ideas. So getting a product to market with zero hard tooling, um, utilizing all these new tools. That was kind of where I came from with that. Um, I wanted to learn how to do stuff on the project. They did, that applies to this project. So um, yeah, had a lot of practice, but obviously I've never done anything like this. Um, I've done some electric go-karts and a scooter and all kinds of stuff like that, but this is kind of a big learning process for me and I kind of want to take you along for it. Um, I'll explain what this thing is in just a moment. Um, the impetus for this project is pretty simple. Um, some people see a future for the sports car. Um, I don't think it's a sustainable one. I don't like pure EV sports cars for a lot of reasons. Um, the main one is that they all basically deliver power the same. You know, all almost all electric cars have permanent magnet motors, which all have the same horsepower and torque curve. No one really talks about that. But um, whether your car is 200 horsepower or 2,000 horsepower, the uh, torque and power curves are almost exactly the same. You can use an induction motor, but so you get two motors, you get two horsepower and torque curves to choose from for every electric car. I still think that's, you know, in this segment, enthusiast cars that kind of are defined by that diversity, I don't think that's sustainable. At the same time, you know, I love ice cars to death. You know, it feels cool when you say ice cars. I have a C7, I've owned. Cobalt SS, M3, E46 M3, Saturn Sky Redline. You know, I'm not going to get rid of those cars ever. <laughs> but I want to see a future where even if the only gas available is 10 bucks a gallon, that people can still enjoy those kinds of cars. So that's really where I'm coming from here. So make the production sustainable, make the low volume production workable, you know, lean on suppliers, forget hard tooling, as little hard tooling as possible. Make these things reproducible and fun and inexpensive as possible so you can keep this enthusiast car way of going. Um, so the car itself, it's basically like a Corvette E-Ray. There's a motor in the back. It's from a BMW K 1600 touring bike, 160 horsepower, 1.6 liter inline six, um, revs to 8,500 RPM, sounds great. It's pretty torquey, six-speed sequential hooked up to it. Um, there were easier motors I could have picked to integrate into this kind of thing, but uh, I wanted to prove that this was a good idea, and that's just a great motor for it. Uh, the front axle is an electric paramotor. It's about 12 pounds. It produces around 35 kilowatts peak. So the total system output is about 200, 210 horsepower in, the, in that region. It depends how you want to put down the power, because you're going to be able to decide that. Um, but basically you have this around 200 horsepower car, um, which please God will weigh under 2,000 pounds. So that's the goal here is a really light car with more than enough horsepower and you get to choose how you use it and with a great engine. So, you know, that's a key mistake hybrid cars make, right? It's like the hybrid system is very interesting. Look at the C63 AMG. It's an inline four. It just sounds like a vacuum cleaner. Remember we got the, the press footage for it? They couldn't even hear the thing. And that has a really interesting hybrid system. It's an electric turbo, all kinds of cool stuff. But the base motor just sucks. And you know, I don't want to fall into that trap. So that's why I chose a straight six. You know, I consider other engines. There's a lot of other good choices, but uh, I just wanted that 8,500 European. I wanted this straight six. And I love straight six cars. So that's what led me down that path. Um, so speaking of the hybrid system, the reason I did it why I did it is because they're independent um, and the integration seems a lot easier. When I drove the E-Ray, I was on the launch of the E-Ray, 
I talked to the chief engineer, Josh Holder, about that because I had this project in mind. And I was actually early stages in it when I drove the E-Ray. And uh, I was like, is this tough to integrate this kind of system? Like early days before you even like, you know, really tried to make this work smooth. How was it? He was like, oh, it worked pretty well. So that was like kind of like, you know, the grinch smile went across my face. Um, because that kind of proves to me that it was all possible. And if the chief engineer of the Corvette is telling you that even as like a simple unintegrated system this worked pretty well, that kind of opened the door for me and made me realize that there was promise here. <laughs> so this would be very cool as just a motorcycle engine car, but I feel like having the hybrid system adds a lot more to it and it addresses a lot of the problems that bike engine powered cars have. So, you know, a big problem bike engine cars have is um, the first one is no reverse. This has some kind of, the K1600 has some kind of starter motor reverse, but get rid of that. Um, the electric motor on the front, give me reverse, you know, you can switch directions, no problem. Another problem is uh, weak alternators. So you put a bike engine in a car, you want to power some accessories, you know, bike engine alternator is not really designed for that. Um, but if you have a hybrid battery, you can charge the 12 volt from the traction battery effectively from the wheels. Say it's a really cold day, you want to put a heated seat time, maybe this thing has heat, I'm not planning that. If it has heat, you know, that might take more power than the alternator can provide. So you switch the traction battery power and you set the region on a light level and you can maintain those accessories um, from the hybrid power. The other thing is, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I touched on the weak clutches, but maybe I didn't. Starting out, you know, you're pulling around a car now with this motorcycle clutch. You're not pulling around a bike with a person on it. Having that electric motor allows you to start off on electric power, switch to ice. The wear on the clutch is much, much less, even though this car is going to be very lightweight. Um, it's going to be a lot less than just kind of dragging this thing off the clutch every time. Uh, so this is a big problem that the hybrid power solves. Um, and this is kind of all enabled by the low weight. You can only use a bike engine because this car is light. You can only do this kind of hybrid system because the car is light. The hybrid system is relatively low voltage. It operates at around 72 volts nominal, 84 volts peak, so under 100 volts. As soon as you go over 100 volts, you get into the territory of these uh, inverters that are just expensive and tough to work with. Not designed for people like me, <laughs> I'll tell you that much. And uh, if you stay under 100 volts, so the options are getting better and better to, uh, to use systems like that, even up to like 500 amps continuous. So, if you, but the problem is that the voltage limits the power. But if you have a light car, you don't need that much power. You don't need that very big of a battery either. So having a light car enables all these things. You know, your power requirements go down, the kind of hardware you can use opens up. So it just all kind of works very nicely. Um, so what I will say is this car is not as light as it can be because of manufacturing constraints. Again, I want this to be manufacturable. Um, so there are seconds of tube that might be thicker than recommended. This whole chassis is a little bit heavier than I'd like. But again, I want this to be reproducible above all else. You know, light weighting is a problem that I can solve down the line. Getting a car on the road is not a problem that I'm going to be held up by if I can't get the right section of tube. Um, so I just want to state that right up front. Yeah, I want it to be scalable, and the future specs can be modified. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's talk about the battery. Sorry about, sorry about the list. Um, if I don't have the list, I'll just ramble on forever. Um, so the battery, a lot of people who are into enthusiast cars are skeptical about hybrid electric vehicles because of primarily the battery. Um, so I, wanted to, I was very careful about how I picked that. So it is a lithium battery. Um, it's not lithium ion battery. It's not lithium ion phosphate. It's a uh, lithium titanate. Um, if you know lithium titanate, you'll know they're not great for full electric cars. The energy density just isn't there. But again, back to the light weighting. With a light car, you don't need very much energy. You can right size the battery. So the battery in this car takes about half of the center tunnel up front. It's about 1.4 kilowatt hours. Um, but what's really important about it is its other characteristics. Um, let, me, let me go into those really quick. So lithium titanate cells are known primarily for very low internal resistance and high power density as a result. The energy is not great. The power is excellent. These things can discharge 500 amps for long bursts. Um, they can regen almost as much, so around 400 amps. So you can pull a lot of power from the wheels and you can send a lot of power out despite having a small battery. Other things that are important, they're extremely safe. 
you can hammer a nail into these cells and they don't catch on fire. I mean, people are skeptical of big batteries because they question how safe they are. These are about the safest cells you can get. Maybe sodium ion is a little bit safer, but uh, I don't see the potential here there, uh, just yet. Um, I think in the future, sodium ion could be an option for this, but not right now. Um, the cycle life on these. People, how much does it cost to replace the battery? Um, I forget how much this battery cost me exactly. Oh, I bought the cells on sale. They're all new cells um, from Toshiba. They're called SCIBs, SCIB, you can look them up. This is a 20 amp hour variety. Um, but, you know, they're rated for 20,000 cycles. So I can't imagine a car like this that's being driven occasionally that the battery will ever degrade considerably or ever have to be replaced. Um, and the other thing is that the cold weather performance, cold weather charging, all that kind of stuff is very, very good. Um, down to negative 20 C, these things still perform very well. So they address a lot of the conventional issues that people have with batteries. And since this is such a light car, the energy density part of it is mitigated. So they're just a very, very good fit for this kind of application. And the other classic criticism that people have about hybrid cars, electric cars, is the weight. Um, that, just, that just doesn't really apply here. The battery is small and light. The battery weighs less than 40 pounds. Um, the motor is from is an electric paramotor. I don't know if you have people who ride around on parachutes. Um, they make electric birds of that now. That's what this is. Um, it's 12 pounds. So, I mean, it puts out 35 kilowatts. So, the, the heaviest part of the electric drivetrain is actually the differentials. That's unique to, not, you know, that's in common with every single car on the road. So, this hybrid system is adding so much capability for such little weight that the weight it adds is just not really a concern. You know, there'll be other parts of the power electronics, you know, stuff like DC, DC converters, all kinds of little stuff like that, but that's not gonna add any considerable weight. So when you right size it, when you get a light car, when you, you know, decide quickly how you're gonna integrate it, it's gonna be lighter, you know, if it was integrated into the transmission or something, but the way this is integrated now, it's a very light system, and what you get for that weight is just, you know, very, very good. So, um, you know, I'll talk more about kind of other aspects of this project in more detail in the future. But um, before I end here, I just want to talk about some cool use cases that are pretty unique. Um, the big thing with this car is that you get an all-electric driving mode since you have the two drive trains are separate. So that means like in traffic, I mean, you know, people who drive stick every day, it doesn't really register with them, like driving stick in traffic is just kind of their reality. But, you know, you can, for this car, you'll be able to switch into all electric mode, take the wear off the clutch. You know, I'm not saying you're gonna be stuck in traffic in this thing all the time, but if you are, just switch the engine off, put it to all electric mode, just fucking coast around, you know, no problem at all. Um, the silent driving in that respect also means that, you know, if you're pulling out of your driveway early in the morning, you can move your car around your driveway, you're coming back late at night, you can just you know, around the corner, shut the engine off, put it in neutral, and just coast in, coast home silently. Um, the E-Ray can do that too, which is just a really cool feature, but this is gonna be more flexible than that. Again, with this car, you'll be able to choose how you use your power, how you regen, how you get that power back, how it's applied to the ground, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the other cool thing is that, you know, I'm not sure if this is gonna be practical or comfortable, or violent, I'm, oh, I'll actually know it will be violent. You will be able to bump start this thing like an LDH car. Um, I don't know how often you'd want to do that. There's better options, you know. Uh, if you're familiar with Derek Young, who built the hybrid Nissan Leaf, if you're not familiar, you should look it up. It's a really cool project. I've spoken to him a lot about it. A lot of experience, really smart guy. Um, but he launches his car in neutral with the clutch in on electric power. And then he has a system where it knows what revs you'll be in at that speed in that gear. Then he's left to clutch out and accelerates from there. That'll be much smoother. And I'd like to have a system like that. But again, I want it to be up to the driver. If they want to bump start this thing and, you know, <laughs> fracture a rib doing it, fine. If they want to break their car doing that, you know, I'll introduce to the best of my abilities that doesn't happen, but fine. Again, a lot of other areas to go deeper on. I'll cover the electric drivetrain, you know, how the whole EV system works in a lot more detail in a future video. I'll discuss more about the chassis. You know, I don't like sharing CAD very much because it's not real and it's subject to change. But um, I'll share a little bit of CAD just to go over the chassis. You know, I'm open to feedback on that. Again, I'm not an engineer. Um, I think this is a good chassis, but um, very open to feedback. Um, 
I'll talk more about the suspension, the axles. You know, I went with Corvette C5 suspension on this for a lot of good reasons. Um, you know, suspension design is like its own field that I have a basic understanding of, but not a deep understanding. I've optimized this car so that the suspension is very adjustable. The way everything mounts is adjustable. So I'll really be able to hone in this car's uh, handling once it's done. Other chassis stuff like, you know, steering, brakes, all that kind of stuff I'll talk about more. Um, the, maybe the mock-up itself a little bit, you know, because this was interesting to put together and um, interesting way to do it. I'd do some, do some small changes next time maybe, but um, for anyone who wants to do this kind of thing on a budget, I can certainly discuss that. Um, but yeah, I really have a lot of thank yous. I mean, thank you guys for hanging around with me on this project. Thank you for being interested. You know, I really, again, I really want to find a future for these kinds of cars. And it excites me that all of a sudden some people feel like it's possible. I certainly do. Um, you know, I can't thank Send Cut Send enough. I mean, geez, <laughs> they're sponsoring this entire mock-up. You know, they are so enthusiastic about it. They really believe this is possible. They know they have the tools to help me. Um, without their support, this just wouldn't be possible. Um, and I'll extend that to, I haven't bought any tubes yet from Oshkut, but uh, Caleb at Oshkut is just a really, really smart guy and has supported this project a lot conceptually. You know, he's excited to see it happen. Um, so just thanks to him too. Um, and all those other guys who do that kind of thing. Fabworks, Jonathan over there. I wouldn't be able to do this kind of stuff without his uh, support and his, uh, his, his service. Um, and Kenneth over at RMFG. You know, those guys are really making these kinds of things possible. You should use their services because they're great. They're only getting better. That's just, that's so exciting to me that making this kind of thing is suddenly possible, but by 2030, it's going to be easy. There's going to be a lot smaller people than me doing this kind of stuff, you know. That is just, that is just thrilling. The technologies are all coming together. Things that were impossible when I was in college are cheap now. <laughs> it's not that they're possible. They're, they're inexpensive. They're accessible. So that's just so exciting. So let, me just, let me stick to the script here. So, yeah, um, you know, again, I want this to be reproducible. I want a lot of people to enjoy this. Um, I'm so thankful for the progress I've made and, you know, you guys and um, sharing this is so important to me. You know, it's one thing to build one cool prototype car that you see on YouTube or whatever. It's another thing to say, oh, my dad had one of those, right? My, my brother had one, I had one, my friend had one of those. That shared experience is what enthusiasm is, it's all about. And, uh, you know, that's what this project is all about. Making this not only a cool thing, but something that maybe someone could build in their garage, maybe something that someone could buy, maybe something that someone wants to help me develop, you know. That is so, so important to me. The future of enthusiast cars is just so, so important to me, you know. It just, sometimes it can seem so bleak, you know. and I've written a lot of articles about how it should be that way, and here's how you can change it. And at a certain point, I just kind of decided, like, well, I always talk about how good these tools are and how possible it is. It's just it's time to give it a shot. Um, so yeah, again, thank you all very much. Um, there will probably be more videos on this because um, I, I want to encourage other people to try the same thing. But uh, yeah, thank you, and uh, I'll see you next time.